All right, this week on The Million Dollar Plan, it's going to get uncomfortable. Look, I don't know if you get uncomfortable when you normally listen, but today it's getting definitely uncomfortable. Talking family and money. Now, here I have some disclaimers before we get started. Uh, number one, I am an expert about money. I am an expert on money. I am, I am, I am. Uh, I am not an expert on relationships. <laughs> now, I've been in a long-term relationship, aka a marriage, with my wife for a very long time. Uh, I still talk to my parents. And my kids still talk to me, primarily because um, they're under eight years old. But I'm not an expert in relationships. But what I'm going to tell you is, is from what I have seen from a financial perspective, I'm going to tell you uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of what I've seen when it comes to money and family. First segment, we're going to deal with younger family, primarily teens to young adults. Teens to young adults. And, and when I get into young adults, I, I even mean adult children who, even if they're 40 and you're still uh, in a relationship with them, I'm talking about those people too. Segment two, we're going to move on to your parents. Now, I don't know how old you are when you sit here and listen to this. I don't even, maybe, uh, maybe you're 80, which means you don't get half my jokes, right? But you think I'm sensible and you clip out my articles and send me your grandchildren. And I appreciate that. Uh, but let's say you're 80. We're not actually talking about your parents. We're talking about you. <laughs> Uh, for, for most people listening, we're, we're talking about your parents. We're going to talk about their financial lives and the impact their financial lives can have on you from a negative uh, standpoint. And then uh, segment three, my, my, my famous fireman story. It's a true story. I want to tell you my fireman story. And I'm going to talk to you about killing chickens. That's right. That's what's on the show. And that's called a tease in the biz. I want to begin by reading. Uh, I'm doing a reading. So if you're watching this on uh, PeteThePlanner.tv, you're thinking, wow, he's just reading from a screen. Yeah, I am just reading from a screen. That's, that's what reading is. Uh, I want to read the comments recently that Chief Justice John Roberts made. He spoke at his ninth grade son's commencement. Apparently, you graduate from ninth grade now. You would think that would be the reason why there are issues in this country. Anyway, he spoke to the kids in his son's ninth grade class uh, about uh, whatever. He gave commencement remarks. And I, I want to read it because to me, this is my exact stance on parenting an adult child or teen from a financial perspective. Okay? I'm quoting Chief Justice John Roberts. Now, the commencement speakers will typically also wish you good luck and extend good wishes to you. I will not do that. And I'll tell you why. From time to time in the years to come, I hope you will be treated unfairly so that you will come to know the value of justice. I hope that you will suffer betrayal because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. Sorry to say, but I hope you will be lonely from time to time so that you don't take friends for granted. I wish you bad luck again from time to time, so that you will be conscious of the role of chance in life and understand that your success is not completely deserved and that the failures of others is not completely deserved either. And when you lose, as you will from time to time, I hope every now and then your opponent will gloat over your failure it is a way for you to understand the importance of sportsmanship. I hope you'll be ignored so you know the importance of listening to others, and I hope you will have just enough pain to learn compassion. Whether I wish these things or not, they're going to happen, and whether you benefit from them or not will depend upon your ability to see the message in your misfortunes. Now, let's go ahead and call that the greatest ninth grade commencement speech of all time. I don't know how many chief justices of the Supreme Court have spoken at ninth grade commencements, but I'm going to take a wild guess and say this is the only time it's ever happened. Uh, and that far and away is the greatest speech of all time at a ninth grade commencement. So it's Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, here's the thing. This is where, I, again, I need to disclaim. I am neither a uh, parenting expert or a relationships expert, but I do know a, quite a bit about money. You have to let your kids fail financially. You have to. And, and when I say kids, I know you're thinking teens, but I, I mean also your young adults in their 20s and, and 30s. And sometimes I even see people assisting folks into their 40s. You need to let them fail. Here's an example. Okay, so let's go back to when your kids are 18 years old, 17 years old. And where you are in your life as a professional, as a consumer, you're at a pretty good spot. Uh, typically speaking, when your kids are their late teens, from a career arc standpoint, unless something weird happened, 
you're, you're still in an up arc, which is to say you can provide nice things because you have stability, right? You, you've, you've got a, hopefully a decent house. Maybe you, you have a decent car. You go on vacations. You have a lifestyle that out now is superior to that of someone who is 22 years old. Can, can we agree with that? I mean, we, we need to agree with that in order for us to move on. So can we just agree, just nod your head? Okay, I'm just going to take it as though you nodded your head. Now, here's the issue. When your child leaves your house uh, post that time, whether it be directly right after high school or after they graduate from college, the challenge becomes to make sure that they don't try to capture that lifestyle right away immediately. Because if they do, it's completely unsustainable, right? That's the, that's the tough part here, is that um, as, as a teen, you learn what it is to have comfort, you learn what it is, what, what a lifestyle looks like, and you want that same lifestyle as a carryover from the time you're 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. I'm not going to keep going. That's enough numbers. But you get my point. You don't want a dip in lifestyle. Why, why would you? Unfortunately, this is where people's lives fall completely apart from a financial standpoint. And I, I, I can say this with great confidence after 20 years in the financial business, which is crazy, by the way. You would think I would look much older. This is an issue. When your kids try to live the exact same lifestyle that they did in their teens when they're on their own, they're generally going to get in trouble. Okay. And so there's also this idea floating around. I, I want to get to this too. There's this idea that if you were to weigh into your kids, weigh in on, on, with an opinion uh, to your children on this topic, you know, there's this idea going around that, uh, well, you can't tell me what to do. It's my right to do what I want to do. And who's to say you're right and I'm wrong. There, there's a lot of that right now. There's a lot of, well, who's to say that this isn't the way it is? Well, you know what? Objectivity is not lost. I, I know that we, uh, opinions and the right to say what you want have, have continued to develop to good parts and bad parts, meaning uh, people can say some pretty outlandish things these days on either side of, of the political spectrum, and, it, and it's considered okay because you're allowed to say whatever you want. But from a financial perspective, you can't let that idea of, well, you can't tell me what to do. You really can because we're talking about numbers, so there are finite uh, things going on here. You know, you, you can't have a 22-year-old look at their parents and say, well, um, I appreciate you trying to, to, to prevent me from making big mistakes, but you can't really tell me what to do. Yeah, you can, actually. Objectivity is not lost. Objectively, uh, you need to make sure as a parent that your kid who's 22 understands the rules of money. There are three, especially when you're 22. There are three things you have to hammer into your kids' heads. And by the way, starting at 22 is not going to work. My daughter's eight. If we called her right now, which I'm not going to because she'll, she's crazy, in a good way, in a good way, and I mean that with love. Someday she'll listen to this uh, right after a therapy session. It'll be great. Um, she, she, I've already taught her these things. And you've got to start teaching your kids. Here are the three things. I don't care how old your kids are. Three things they have to know. Because when they hit 22, whatever number you want to use to represent their independence from you, which, by the way, don't make it older than 22, these are the three things. Invest early. They don't know what it means. You may not even know what it means. You may not know why. They may not know why. But trust me, invest early. If you want your kid to have stability and to be a millionaire, and if that drives you, whatever, have them invest early. Have them invest uh, parts of their first paycheck uh, when they're 16 and get the, their job. I mean, think about this. The $1,000 maybe they put away long-term in an investment when they're 16 years old, do you know how powerful that money will be when it's all said and done? It will have doubled seven times by the time they're 60 years old, or by the time they're 68 years old. Think about that. My math's wrong. 65 years old. It will double seven times. 1,000 will become 2,000. 2,000 will become 4,000. Four to eight. This sounds like uh, Jay-Z's new album. Uh, eight to 16. 16 to 32. 32 to 64. 64 to 128. $1,000 properly invested when you're 16 will turn into $128,000. That's why you have to encourage that. Number two restrained borrowing. Now, this is a tough one. 
This is a tough one because you may not be living a restrained borrowing lifestyle. Right? You may have gone to some internet calculator and said, how much house can I afford? What's the most you let me borrow? And then that's the house you live in, and that's the house you struggle in right now. And you're like, why are we struggling? It's because you don't exercise restrained borrowing. You need restrained borrowing. You just do. So you need to make sure that your child understands that borrowing uh, will be allowed much more than it should be exercised that you can't go and say, how much can I borrow? You can never go to a car lot and say, what can I get approved for? These are disastrous, disastrous moments in your life that you will never get back. A study came out this week, as it always does, uh, the, the, the current state of new car payments in uh, this beautiful land of ours. The average car loan is 69.3 months long. The average new car loan right now in America, is 69.3 months long, and the average payment is $517 a month. And you look at that and you say, who can afford that? You're exactly right. No one can. It's people that go to the lot and say, what will you let me borrow? Restrained borrowing is important. And as we wrap up segment one here, number three is budgeting. It's budgeting. It's resourcefulness, knowing that no matter what resources you have in front of you, whether it's a, you get home, we, we go grocery shopping on Sundays at our house, right? So we have the most groceries, the most food resources in our house on Sundays. If we go hog wild when those groceries are put away, by Tuesday, we're out of food. We're definitely out of Cheetos by then, right? So whatever your resources are, you have to teach resourcefulness. This is why, and I have no basis uh, of expertise to say this. I don't really care. Never stops me. Uh, when you have unlimited minutes and texts and these things for kids on a cell phone, while that's a practical solution because they, they will go over their limit and hurt you, they learn nothing about resourcefulness. Nothing about resourcefulness. Coming up after the break, we're going to flip this completely on your head. We're going to talk about your parents. We're going to talk about uh, baby boomers and what it is to help them financially know what they need to know. All that's next on The Million Dollar Plan. I'm Pete the Planner. Back on the Million Dollar Plan with Pete the Planner Family and Money Edition. <laughs> Grab your scotch. Um, you probably don't want to hear about the glass of 18-year Glenlivet I had this week that was delicious. Of course it is. It's 18 years, and it's one of the Glens, so it's always good. Uh, okay, so uh, first segment we talked about um, sort of helping. We, you know, we really didn't. We talked about some rules for teaching your kids about money. L- let, me, let me just complete the thought from the first segment. The, fir- the segment was parenting adult and young adult children when it comes to their money. Let them fail. Don't co-sign stuff too much. Maybe, maybe at the very beginning. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of co-signing. I don't know why I'm apologetic about that. I'm just not. Their parents didn't co-sign for them, did they? Uh, if, if, okay, here's the rule. If, if you're a, a parenting a, a, a millennial and your parents, the parent of the millennial, your parents co-signed for you, then go ahead and co-sign. If they didn't, don't, right? You have to have a dip in lifestyle when you're on your own. You just do. You have to have a dip in lifestyle. You can't go out to eat as much. You can't drive as nice cars. You can't live in as nice place. You can't go on as nice vacations. Why? Because mathematically, it doesn't make sense. So it, my advice is this. Cut yourself off financially from your young adult family. If you want to take them on a vacation from time to time, sure. If you want to take them out to eat time to time, fine. But don't support them. I, I, and I'm going to illustrate a point later, uh, next segment, the fireman story. Not a fireman calendar story. That's different. It's a fireman story. And, and it, it will illustrate the point beautifully as to why I say what I say. If you're watching on Pete the Planner TV, I'm sorry I keep touching my eyes. We're in a situation in which my allergies are beyond control these days. If you happen to be an allergist, which I don't even know if that's a job, and uh, hit me up at askpete at petetheplanner.com saying, I, I can solve your life's problems, and that's the subject line. All right, so let, let's get on into uh, now adult parents. Uh, in other words, baby boomers. If you're listening or watching the program right now, 
and you're living your own life as an adult, and but you have to consider the financial ramifications of what's going on in your parents' lives. This segment is for you. I wrote about this in my USA Today column a few months ago, and, and it all comes down to could, would, and should. Okay, if, you're, if your parents are struggling, the first place to start is, can you help them? Could you help them? Can you help them? Are you in a position to help them, right? And, and also, if you're listening now and you're a baby boomer, you're watching now and you're a baby boomer, let, let's think of it this way. If you're struggling financially and you're thinking about uh, needing help or if you need help and you're, you're thinking about who you can approach, is the person, can they help you? objectively. I mean, again, th this show is about objectivity. And when I'm not objective, when I'm just giving you an opinion, I, 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 a non-objective opinion, a subjective opinion, I will tell you. But objectively, if you look at the people you're asking to help you, you're not looking for someone that's in a better position than you. You're looking for someone that is in a good position. You say, no, let me, it sounds like I'm splitting hairs there, but I'm really not. If you're struggling as a baby boomer right now financially, and you're going to ask an adult child of yours to help you. You're not looking for someone who's doing better than you. You're looking for someone who is doing well. See the difference? Because if you're doing poorly and they're doing poorly, they're just doing a little less poorly, you're going to take the whole ship down when you get their help. So the first question, the first barrier is could that individual help you? Next up is would they help you? Right? If you can get past could, if they can't help you, then it's over. Right? If they can help you, would they? Would they be willing to do it? And, and, and for me, this is where a plan comes into place. I think there's a couple different ways you can financially assist an older adult family member. Number one, there's lump or chunk support, which just means you give them a chunk of money. Like, like think if you're struggling and you're a baby boomer and $10,000 somehow makes your problems go away. I, do I need to come up with an example here for it? Uh, let's say that um, you have a medical bill that's $10,000 and you can't afford the, the monthly payments for it. And once that medical, and it's a one-time medical issue, it's not a chronic issue that's going to come back. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. But it, that one thousand or that one ten thousand dollar payment makes the medical bill go away, and then your cash flow is stabilized and you're good to go. So that's a lump or chunk help. The second one is monthly help. Uh, we need $300 more a month. We need $200 more a month. We need four, whatever, right? I'm just going to give you a bunch of numbers. That's the other, uh, it, whether you're on the side of the borrower or the person lending the person the money, um, you need to make that determination. Is this going to be, A, a gift or a loan? Probably a gift at this point. If, if, a, if a baby boomer is struggling financially, unless there's a big chunk of life insurance that'll pay you back out, when you're helping them, it is a gift. It is, it is not, well, I'm going to borrow. Let, let's not give the illusion that anyone's borrowing any money. If, if a baby boomer is struggling financially, uh, the money they get is not a, a loan, right? So if you are in your 30s or 40s and, and you look at the life of your parents and as they prepare for retirement or they're in retirement, and you have to understand that the baby boomers are tragically unprepared for retirement. I know there's a lot going on in our world right now um, on a political um, basis, and it's hard to read any other news that isn't political news, but there is a retirement crisis. I talk about it on the show all the time. There's a retirement crisis. 10,000 baby boomers a day are retiring right now, and a vast majority of those people are completely unprepared to retire. So this topic may not be pertinent to you right now. Oh, but it will statistically likely be uh, important to you at some point in time. It will be pertinent. Because chances are, if your parents have not retired yet, they will retire at some point in time. And statistically speaking, they won't be prepared to retire even though they're going to retire. That's what people don't understand about retirement is that you're allowed to retire even when you shouldn't. <laughs> right? Hey, it's like, it's like uh, I can run with my shirt off at night around my neighborhood for my exercise. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Unless my neighbors are like, hey, I'm looking to lose a little weight and I don't want to eat as much. Can you run your shirt off as an appetite suppressant for me? And I was like, sure, let me, let me, let me be the before picture for you. I take off my shirt and run. 
you have to understand uh, that at some point in time that you can retire and you shouldn't retire because you're not prepared to. You can make it the first few years, things are going okay. Come 72, 73 years old, it is a buzzsaw and it'll come back and get you. And so the challenge with all of this is to understand as the person, the younger adult, someone in their 30s or 40s, what are you willing to do? What are you gonna be asked to do? What is your problem and isn't your problem? Which then gets us to the should, right? There's the could you help, would you help, and should you help? I don't want to see a family member destitute financially. If I'm in a position to help, I probably would if there is a plan in place. I don't like the idea of throwing good money after bad, and that sounds like I'm a horrendously callous person. But I think anytime you deal with trying to help an adult family member financially, uh, the throwing good money after bad is a real thing. It's an ugly thing. It's a real thing. And which brings us to the whole reason that this is an issue for more people than it should be in 2017. Uh, and that reason is uh, medical bills, medical expenses. The medical expenses for people from 65 to 85. So let's imagine you retire, you're 65 years old, you and your significant other, uh, and then you're retired for that 20 year time frame, 65 to 85. Over that 20 year period right now, the average out of pocket medical costs are $260,000. I'm not gonna let you gloss over that number because I'm gonna hit it a little couple more times. 260 thousand dollars out of pocket that means from your income from your retirement assets over that 20 year period two hundred and sixty thousand dollars of whatever money you have available is going towards your health care and if you retire or try to uh if you if you try to step away from work uh, your primary source of income prior to 65 the medical bills are going to be worse than that because you won't have medicare Right? You'll be dealing with whatever health plan you have. And I see that all the time. People have their financial lives ruined by their medical bills. You know, one, one thing we never really talk about on this show, and I, I probably should do it one time. I've had this show in some capacity since I think 2009. Was that eight years? I'm not good with numbers. Uh, I've never talked about bankruptcy. Is that right? Eight years? I've never talked about bankruptcy. Medical bankruptcy can make some sense. If you've got medical bills that stem from an incident or something that is uh, then fixed and not going to be a chronic issue, and those medical bills are choking you so bad that you can't stay retired or retire, consider a bankruptcy for those medical bills. I'm the last person in the world wants anybody to shirk their financial responsibilities, but let, let's, let's look at the laws that exist and, and, and try to understand why they exist. What's the reason they're there for situations like this? If your retirement or your parents' retirement is a problem because of medical bills and those medical issues are solved, which is an important factor in this, consider medical bankruptcy. Talk to an attorney. I should do a show on that. I really should. Nicole, let's make a note. Uh, let's do a show on bankruptcy, begrudgingly after eight years. And wh why do I say that um, I want to make sure that the, the medical issues are solved? Because if you file for bankruptcy, the medical issues aren't solved, then the bills are just going to stack up again, and you've already played your bankruptcy card, and, and then you're in trouble. Worse trouble than you were at the beginning. All right, coming up after the break, uh, I, I want to talk about rules for your parents. Financial rules for your parents. Yeah, that's right. And then the fireman story. All that's next on The Million Dollar Plan. I'm Pete the Planner. All right, back on The Million Dollar Plan. I'm Pete the Planner. Uh, talking uncomfortable topics today. Money and family. Yeah, I kept talking in the last couple of seconds about like making objective statements, but sometimes objective statements are uncomfortable to hear. And that's why people say, well, that's not always the case. No, sometimes objective statements are just that they're objective and they're just ugly truths. Like, Hey, if your adult parents are struggling in their sixties or seventies, 
maybe it doesn't make sense to help them because you're throwing good money after bad. And some people will say, well, that's rude. You should go down with the ship. You should do everything you can to help them. I don't know. Does this make me a bad person? No, it makes me an objective person. It makes me a person that says, if your parents are 60s and the 70s and you do everything you can to help them and it doesn't help them, and by the way, if you've done everything you can to help them, that means you're hurt too. The whole ship goes down. It's not fun to hear. It's objective. Let me tell you a story. It's called the fireman story. True story. This happened to me. I'm not a fireman. Not a fireman. So back in the day when I had clients, which I don't have clients, don't call me. Um, I had a client who was a fireman. He was a fire, uh, whatever the heck, this is where my lack of, of manliness really comes into play. I don't know what the head of a particular firehouse is called. Is he called the chief or is like the main person at the building who doesn't fight fires called the chief? I don't know. But anyway, there's this guy and he's the head of the firehouse. This is uh, in the area in which I live. And uh, he was the head, whatever, chief. We'll call him chief. His son, uh, after a, a quick career change, decides to go into the family business and fight fires. So his dad is so excited. He is so excited that his son is going to leave his higher paying job to come fight fires. And that's going to be his career. His dad's just so excited. His dad's my client. So um, the, the kid comes to, uh, and works for a few months, and he goes to his dad, and he says, Dad, uh, I love it here. It's great. It's so wonderful. Uh, I'm struggling financially. I have $6,000 in credit card uh, debt that, that's choking me, and I, and I need some help. Now, despite what you may think about fire chiefs or whatever the head of the, the firehouse is called, this particular guy... The reason he came to me because he was struggling and he wanted some help. Sure, he had a pension that was coming down the road, but he didn't have a lot of assets now. He didn't have a lot of things, liquid cash or um, money available to him. He, he just didn't. But he had a little bit. Had a little bit. And so he made a withdrawal out of something he shouldn't have to pay off his son's $6,000 in, in credit card debt. And and everything was fine. He felt good about it, although he was a little on edge. And his son was grateful. About two months later, his son pulls up to his shift at the firehouse in a $45,000 pickup truck. And his dad looks at him. He's like, what, what's going on here? And the son's like, well, thank you for helping me pay off that credit card debt because that was what was preventing me from being able to afford the monthly payment on this new truck. The monthly payment was something like 500 I don't know. Who cares what the payment was? And so the, the, the dad is enraged, right? At, at this point, he's like, wait a second. I sacrificed my financial stability so that you could buy a, 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 this sort of big truck here? So there was some beef, right? They're, they're sort of upset about this. I, it was, I, I can, as I think back to the conversations around this, it was a really tough thing. Six months later, the fire chief, or whatever the guy who runs the house is called, uh, has some major medical situation going on. And he goes through all the assets he has, his coverage doesn't take care of it, and he's got extra medical bills, like $10,000 in medical bills or something like that. Um, but now he's, he's, got, he's got no money. So now here's a, a fireman who was at some point had some level of stability, right? Sacrificed it. The son took the sacrifice and got a new truck. Meanwhile, now that the stability has gone, it completely flips and the father is struggling and he goes to his son and he says, I just want you to know how the rest of this played off. And his son said, well, that stinks, doesn't it? Right? Extreme story? Yes. Are there, are there little bits of truth in the story I just told in every financial situation in which family members intermingle, intertwine themselves like a shredded wheat biscuit financially? The, every single time there is a bit of truth in the story I just told in, in your story, if you're, if you're intermingling finances. So I'm going to give you a couple rules, okay? If you have a family member who is older than you, a parent, a baby boomer, who is struggling, here's your, here's your attack plan. Number one, help them reduce their monthly obligations. Okay, so, so think of it this way. I've said it before. Um, some people will not be able to retire because they have a lot of money. Instead, they'll be able to retire because they don't need a lot of money. 
So the way to attack a situation like this is to get expenses on a monthly recurring basis as low as possible, right? You don't ever want to support a bloated lifestyle. That's a, that's a fool's errand. Don't do it. If you look at your parents' finances and, and go, well, they really shouldn't have this, this, or this, don't help. You're going to go down with the ship. Don't do it. Number two, don't let them kill chickens. Here's what I mean by that. Their assets in retirement, that money is meant to create income. It's meant to lay eggs, if you will, right? And if they need more money than the eggs available, then they go and take the principal and kill chickens and take more money out of their investments than they should ever take. I don't like people taking any more than 4% of their total investment portfolio out in any given year. That's the max, 4%. What's the math on that? Okay, if someone has $100,000 to their name, they should not take out more than $4,000 that year. And you're going, well, that doesn't seem like much. Yeah, I, I know, because I'm using math, <laughs> okay? And you go, well, it's an emergency. Emergencies also are subjective. I, I think that's the tough thing is here is that... Uh, once you're bad at identifying what an emergency is, it's only downhill from there, right? Well, this was an emergency. No, it wasn't. And now you've tapped more than 4%. You've killed a chicken. You're in trouble. So don't let your parents kill chickens. Uh, this, this next thing is not really a piece of advice other than just a reality. Uh, if, if someone is retired in their post-65, they're in their late 60s, early 70s, and their plan isn't working now, what's going on in their financial life, their cash flow isn't working now, it's unlikely to get, or, or pardon me, it is unlikely to get better. It is likely to get worse. This is a, a depressing, hard truth to hear, but it is so true. If you're looking at a retiree who is struggling cash flow wise, understand it is likely to get worse for medical bill reasons, cost of living, the cost increase of, of utility payments. So just understand that that's what you're up against. And finally, a big, big part of this, especially prior to someone being 65, is help to identify the moving pieces. When they should take Social Security, should they wait until they're 70, should they wait until they're 62, or, or start when they're 62. And this is why they should talk to a qualified financial advisor to really help with those decisions. If your parents are struggling financially and they're thinking about taking Social Security to solve the problem, insist they sit down with a financial advisor, which I am not one, so do not call me. Coming up after the break, biggest waste of money of the week, and that's about it, because we're almost out of time. I'm Pete the Planner, and this is The Million Dollar Plan. Back with the Buam here on The Million Dollar Plan, biggest waste of money of the week, as we quickly run out of time on this week's show. Uh, the workhorse Surefly personal aircraft, in case you haven't noticed, the race to build a flying car is over. The race to define personal mobility has just begun. The workhorse Surefly personal aircraft is a drone-like two-seater, perfect for urban life. Eight independent motors power eight carbon fiber propellers, all run by a gasoline engine. There's a battery backup in case that fails, and a ballistic parachute for worst case scenarios. With a range of up to 70 miles and a running time of one hour, it has the capability to make your morning commute way less obnoxious. And it cost $200,000. Now, here's the thing. It's really cool. Like, it's groundbreaking cool. Unfortunately, do you really want a bunch of people flying overhead who are, have no idea what they're doing? Of course not. So the whole point of a pilot's license is that you have to know what you're doing. You, you don't want some rich guy who doesn't know what he's doing flying over the head of you. No. That's why it's this week's biggest waste of money of the week. Go to PeteThePlanner.com to learn more. Be on my podcast. I'll fix your financial life. That's not a guarantee. Asterisk. Uh, go to PeteThePlanner.com slash podcast. I've run out of time. I've run out of time. Uh, don't throw good money after bad. Uh, don't go down with the sinking ship. Blah, 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 blah. Sending you good vibes because good vibes are all that's in the budget. I'm Pete the Planner, and this is the Million Dollar Plan.
this is where I came from. Planet Love Tron, where we drop love bombs, funk missiles, and live in soul shelters. No help to skelter. The heat don't swelter because everybody stays cool. Left many moons ago to bring the philosophies of my ancestors to another place, God. Picked the third rock, gave me to my Earth family, and told me to create. And so I am. Pin in my hand, microphone on the stand. Over vinyl, I command and demand. Magnificence in an instance, I can make you dance, cry, or love. Fly as a dove, released from Everest. The fresh is fresh, and you can call me E.T. Word to John Tesh. Let me bless this harmonic presentation. It's amazing, so amazing. I'm the reason. Uh. Salutations, I bring you love, trying greetings from a far away land. I am the soul controller. Put the remote down and let me take control. You're now a part of my zone, so enjoy yourself. Love, trying can restore your health. I bring you greetings. Uh, salutations, how you doing? And is that how y'all say it? The tinkling of the keys is an homage to the little, little star. I sojourn over poetic descriptions of sound to travel to my other world. Out of this world, spaceship on my arm took me home, filled by the ink and the megabytes and the hypertext transfer protocol stronger than the Skynet and the Terminator. I push faders into warp speed, glide with.